Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Some of you who have been around Cornerstone for a long time, you've memorized this, not only in one version, but multiple versions. Today, as we consider Philippians chapter 6, excuse me, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, I want to challenge us again to memorize God's Word. Last week, we talked about fasting. Week before, we talked about being filled with the Spirit. And the week before, we talked about being set apart. All in our desire to abandon average and become what Jesus wants us to be. It is no secret that Jesus was not your average run-of-the-mill 30-something. It is no secret that Jesus was not your average run-of-the-mill preteen at 12 years of age. He was sitting with scholars. It is no secret that Jesus was not your run-of-the-mill average little baby laid in a manger. Or as a child, your average run-of-the-mill toddler who just gets, happens to get visited like every other buddy who gets visited by three wise men from a long ways off, right? He was above average. He was... He was constantly drawing the attention and his life reflects that. And I'm going to tell you something. If we are going to be Christ-like, if you truly are going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, there should be some similarities happening in your life that happened in the life of Jesus. And in First Fruits, we are simply taking the time every Sunday to once again focus on one of these aspects that allows us to tap into the life of Christ. We need to know, you need to know that we have been made partakers of the divine nature by God's spirit. But I'm going to tell you what, if you don't set yourself apart unto God, you will set yourself aside to something else. Something's going to capture your mind. Something's going to capture your heart. Something's going to capture your wallet. Something's going to capture your spare time, your daydreams, your night dreams. There are things out there vying for our attention and it is a battle. And so if you are going to abandon average, you have got to put on the armor. You have got to set your mind, set your heart, put your feet in a course that is going to bring you to that place. Listen, the football teams that are going to play in the Super Bowl next week didn't wake up three weeks ago saying, hey, you know what? I think we should play in the Super Bowl. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, let's, let's just go. Let's, go. let's go get it, guys. Come on, let's go get it. You know when they started? Spring camp, Right? But you know what preceded spring camp? College. You know what preceded college? High school. You know what preceded high school? Little guy football. Have you ever watched those little guys play? Helmets so big they get (laughs) bobbled in them, you know? (laughs) It's crazy. Hey, listen, if you are going to be like Jesus, it doesn't start by just one day waking up saying, hey, I want to walk on water. It doesn't start by just saying, I want to go cast out some demons, or I want to go feed 5,000, or I want to pray and fast for 40 days. No, you've you got to begin right where you're at. Number one, be set apart. Set your life apart under righteousness. Number two, be filled with the Spirit, because you can't do it by yourself. Your own willpower falls short of being able to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. Hey, listen, if you could have done it without God, you'd have already done it. But the truth is, because you can't do it without God, you haven't got it. That's where Romans tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God says, I'm going to make them to where they need me. And you need him. I need him. And we need each other. Realize that as we are filled with his spirit, we will find ourselves constantly being drawn by the spirit into things that you may not be be real comfortable with. I mean, when's the last time you went out and looked uh, for an opportunity to go on a 40-day fast? When's the last time you were drawn to your enemies? Not so, that you, not so that they could forgive you, but so that you could forgive them. When was the last time you went out of your way of somebody who agitated you or irritated you and intentionally did something kind? I'm not talking about just courtesy kind. I'm talking about generosity kind. The kind that leaves the person who has done you wrong with their jaw dropped down saying, Wow. You see, that's what Jesus did. And Jesus came to show us how to walk in that same thing. And one of the things that really challenges us is the topic this week, and that's prayer. Prayer has the ability to frustrate people. Prayer has the ability to comfort people. It has the ability to call us into a lot of things. It has the ability to take us away from a lot of things. We're going to talk about that. 
Our memory verse this week is Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. If you've got it memorized, good job. If you don't have it memorized, you're not dead yet. Don't give up. Don't give up. Read it with me if you would. As soon as it gets up there. There it is. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Amen. Who gets to hear your requests? Let me say, let me correct that. Who should get to hear your requests? God, right. Listen, the question of prayer is is a big question. And some people today are asking many questions about prayer. And one of the questions they ask is, why pray? I want to challenge you. Why why do you pray? Why, Why do you pray? Is it to get what you want? Or is it to get to know the God who supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory? Now, those of you who were trying to be real spiritual, you probably said, yeah, that, that's, that's the one. I pray so I can get to know God. Those of you who are being real honest said, yeah. The idea of pure motives in this concept of prayer is, is really a challenge. Because the truth is, when you go to pray, you go to pray typically because there's something you long for. There's something that you are desiring. Now, your desire may be to know God more, but you still want something, right? So the truth, the the honest answer, the answer you need to be ready to give is when somebody says, why pray? You say, listen, I pray because I want things. And I pray because I know who can supply them. And so it's a win-win situation, isn't it? On the one hand, you say, I'm being selfish. On the other hand, you're saying, I'm being selfless. The truth is, God wants to supply your needs according to his riches and glory. But guess what? Some people don't get it because they don't ask. So what is it? It's both. (laughs) Why pray? Because we are needy people. Why pray? Because I don't have it all together. I need love. I need joy. I need peace. I need gentleness. I need kindness. I need patience. I need long suffering. I need answers. I need money. I need people. I need friends. I need places. I need cars. I need problems fixed. I need answers resolved. I need these things. So I choose to pray. I wish I could sit here and stand here and tell you that prayer is just a Christian thing. The truth is, the saintness prays for much the same reason. He wants something. The atheist prays. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor Mike, that doesn't work. Atheists don't believe in God. Prayer is not a Christian thing. Prayer is just simply making your request known. The atheist prays to himself because he sees himself as the source. The reality of this verse simply says and very bluntly says, don't be anxious for anything. And listen, if you are anxious about something that Jesus died on the cross to leave us from, you are in absolute disobedience and dishonoring the cross of Christ. So let's break this verse down. Three things I want to bring out of this verse. Number one, the purpose of prayer is relief. Be anxious for nothing. Some of you need to just, you mean I don't have to worry? Right. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you don't have to worry. You don't have, some of you don't believe that. Some of you think that that's one of the gifts of the Spirit is to worry. Let me help you. It's not. Worrying is not a gift of the Spirit. Worrying is not the will of God for His people. Worrying is not for those who are fully trusting God. You know, sometimes, one time Jesus said, the world is smarter than the children of of the kingdom of heaven. And I think somebody had it right years ago when they said, don't worry, be happy. Now, they had some other things in mind, and I'll question their motive all day long, but you know what I'm saying. When the world is able to say, hey, I'm not going to worry about it, but we as Christians are constantly taking things back from the throne of grace that we've laid down, and we are worrying ourselves sick to the point of arthritis. We are worrying ourselves sick to the point of, of, of uh, what's that thing that bleeds inside you? Ulcers. There we go. Thank you. We are worrying ourselves to the point of gray hair. We are worrying ourselves to the point of all kinds of other medical and, and mental conditions. And the world looks at us and says, I want to be like you? No. The Bible says be anxious for nothing and realize that prayer brings relief. Relief 
is what we are able to experience when we finally quit trying to play God. So how do you spell relief? (laughs) How should a Christian spell relief? G-O-D. Or in light of our subject today, (laughs) P-R-A-Y-I-N-G. Prayer is how the Christian should respond to anxiety because it brings relief. Listen, the word anxiety means I'm nervous, I'm worried, I'm concerned, I'm uneasy, apprehensive. It could be I'm restless or I'm fretful. It could be that I am frightened or fearful. And you've got a lot of blank paper there. I want you to think about something that caused you to be anxious this last week, would you? Some of you aren't writers and I understand that, but I want you to capture something right now that that, that God would bring to your mind that you got anxious over, you got a little nervous about, you got fearful, you got frightful. And I want you to think about that and I want you to hold on to that because I want you to understand he already knows what it was that caused you to be nervous and he's already got the answer and the answer is going to be found in, in prayer. Some of you can't think of anything from last week. Think about what's coming. There's a Monday tomorrow, right? Lord willing. There's a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday. There's a Super Bowl next Sunday. There's a business meeting tonight. What causes us to be anxious? What causes us to be nervous or fearful? Are we responding in prayer? Are we responding the way God has showed us to respond? The next thing is to remember. This Bible verse simply says, with prayer, excuse me, and with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. The idea of giving thanks is the idea of remembering. Every Thanksgiving, we always talk about what God has done for us and how we are thankful. The first original Thanksgiving that we often think about when we think about the pilgrims and we think about the Indians was that time they got together and they said, thank God we didn't keep fighting the Indians. Thank God we finally broke through these barriers and we got together and we started receiving the help they had and we offered some things and now we can have this dinner saying, thank God, because we remember. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and thanksgiving, prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Prayer is not just about finding relief, it's about a time to remember. Prayer reminds us of who our daddy is. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Prayer is that opportunity for you to humble yourself. It's that opportunity for you to remember where you go to for peace and joy and gentleness and kindness. And I don't know who this may fit, but I believe this is one of those stones. In your patience, you will find the key to submission. In your patience, you will find the key to submission. And I'm convinced that God has in our prayer lives the opportunity to put things in such a way that we are doing so much more than we could ever imagine simply by being obedient. And when something nails us and we want to respond with anxiety, we want to respond with fear and nervousness, we choose to say, I am not going to give in to that. I am going to submit myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am going to wait on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am going to watch him do great things on behalf of those who trust him. The last part of this memory verse that stands out to me is the idea of requesting. Jesus said, and we're going to talk about this in just a little bit. He said, your father already knows what you have need of before you ask. So why ask? Why ask? If God already knows what I need, if God already knows and wants to supply all my needs, do it, God. Just do it, right? Why should I have to sit around? Why do I need to humble myself before you? Why do I need to remember all that you've done for me in the past? It's a very simple answer. God is not a vending machine. God wants a personal relationship 
And he wants the relationship of creation and creator, father and child, where we can come boldly before the throne of grace and talk to him. You see, prayer is so much more than just a wish list. Prayer is so much more than these other things that we often get caught up in. And we're going to talk about this in just a little bit more because the truth is, if you get prayer wrong, you could have all kinds of problems. And I don't want you to have all kinds of problems. You see, prayer can either hit or it can miss. And listen, if prayers hit, they become great steps of faith. But when prayers miss, they can become great steps of backsliding. And we need to listen to what Jesus has to say. And so this memory verse, be anxious for nothing, but in everything. God, I am not going to respond like my body wants me to. I am not going to respond like the world wants us to respond. I am going to put myself in a position where I am focusing, I am constantly looking for the relief that you have for me in every situation. And I am going to constantly remember in the midst of my circumstances that you have been here before and you already have a way. And because I am choosing those things, I am going to constantly ask. Jesus shared the story one time about prayer. He said there was a lady a widow who needed the judge to do something for her. So he found, she found his house and she knocked. The Bible says the, the judge was one of those judges that didn't fear God or man. He was all full of himself. He didn't care what anybody thought about him. He was going to be the way he was and he wasn't going to change. I am and I am, he was basically saying. He didn't fear God, he didn't fear man. But this woman kept knocking. She'd leave, she'd come back. Knock again, knock again. Finally, Jesus said in this story, the judge says, even though I don't fear God, I don't fear man, this woman is going to drive me crazy. So you know what, what he does? He goes down and he takes care of what, what needed. And Jesus said these words, will the son of man find such faith on the earth when he comes? What kind of prayer are you? How passionate are you? I got a little video here that I hope will challenge us in this area of prayer. And I want you to watch it with the idea that, you know what? If one of these is a mirror for you, consider it God's tap on the shoulder to say, I want so much more than what you've settled for. Consider the skinny on prayer. My prayer life is vibrant and it's active daily. I like to commune with God at nighttime. I get under those warm covers and I kiss my wife goodnight then I just start talking to God. Just me and God. Tell Him everything. <sighs> Makes me just sleepy just thinking about it. And there I am, just laying in bed, laying out my request to Him, and He's hearing me, and I know that I'm in good company with it. Where was I? The efficiency of one's prayers are directly congruent to the position of one's body. Therefore, the legs should be saying, God, help me. <laughs> Amen. There are times that me and God do not talk, and that is not God's fault. That is mine. I just get so busy. And so when I do end up talking to God, I really just try to impress him, give him a show, to just to show him how much I love him. So excuse me, will you, as I pray to God. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh, Heavenly Father, beseech me not unto thee. How now, brown cow? Oh, thy soul is so dry, and if I can just catch a morsel of who you are, so verily, merrily. 
down the stream. God, I, I just want to be used by you. God, I want... I want to be salt and light and light and salt and sight and loved and peppers and oregano and pepperoni and black olives and this little bit. When I like to get my prayer on, uh, there's some things I keep in mind. Um, I think it's totally awesome that uh, God is like Santa Claus and he wants to give you the things that you want. Therefore, you need to keep lists of things. My list currently has 745 prayer requests on them. So then when I go to the Lord in prayer, it looks a little something like this. I'll just pray real quick. Um, Let's see. The uno thing on my list is my mom. And so I'll pray for her now. Dear Heavenly Father, I lift up this sweet salt of the earth lady that you have blessed me with to be my mother. And I tell you thank you. And although I know that I'm called to respect her and I give her all due respect, there's also an issue of something she truly needs. And that is to stop a yapping. Lord, she yaps and she doesn't know how to stop yapping. So could you please make her mute just for a day? Nothing permanent. Don't hurt her. I love her. Just mute her. Take your big God remote and push mute on her channel. That would be great. Henceforth, I would go on and pray all 746 things. God, you are greater than anything this world has to offer. And I can't wait for you to come back and get us. I want to take a time out here because what, what's fixing is the rest of the story. And I want to get to that. But I want you to realize there's a problem with prayers in there. And some of you laughed because it was funny. Some of you laughed because, oh boy, I've been there. And I really believe that we we really need to come to some understanding because if you can see this, you realize that sometimes the funny things in life are painfully true. And when we find ourselves faced with this idea of prayer, we, we really need to look to Jesus We really do. And so turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, excuse me. Let me me walk you through some of the things that Jesus had to say about prayer. And then I want us to watch this last part where he goes through the Lord's Prayer in a very personal, relational, effective way. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. Jesus says, when you pray, notice he didn't say, if you pray. He did not leave it up to us to decide whether this was a good spiritual practice. He said, when you pray. Matter of fact, he goes on further and says, men ought always to pray. The dynamic of prayer in our Christian life should be as constant as the sun shining. And even when you can't see the sun, it is still shining somewhere, isn't it? There should be this concept in our lives where prayer is not something we have to stop and interrupt everything, but it can flow from our depths. And yet, I will tell you this, the person who sells themselves short by simply saying, oh, God and I talk all the time, and never finds those quiet places, is not doing what Jesus did or doing what Jesus said. Consider with me quickly Matthew chapter 5 as Jesus shares on prayer for his disciples. He says in Matthew chapter 5, excuse me, 6, I keep going to chapter 5, I apologize, 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. In this verse 5, there are some things that come out about prayer. Number one, prayer is a platform. Prayer is a platform. Prayer has the ability to put us in a place where either pride selfishness self-absorbed self-centeredness becomes the cover becomes the motive becomes the pride before the fall becomes a stumbling block and I will tell you this my children have been in this body 
They have been around the, the church ever since they have been born. Matter of fact, before they were born, somebody came up to one of my daughters and says, yeah, I was here in church before you came. I said, he had to come before you were conceived <laughs> because you've been here almost every Sunday, almost every time, even before you were born. And as they have watched individuals handle this area of prayer, they have watched the people who are effective in prayer. And they have also watched the phonies who use prayer as a platform to promote themselves. My children aren't alone. Matter of fact, as we walk through this, let me, just, let me just say this. I realize that there may be some of you in here who have a heart after God and you are so passionate about wanting to do what Jesus did. But I also realize that just because you're in church doesn't mean you want anything to do with Jesus. I realize that some of our children downstairs would rather be like Batman, Superman, the Hulk, or any of these other guys that are being promoted, girls that are being uplifted and worshipped, than to be like Jesus. So let me settle the facts here. The truth is, you will become like somebody. Even when you reject everybody else's ideas in your life, you are becoming just like somebody else who rejected other people's input years ago. And so today I realize I'm preaching to those who are passionate to be like Jesus and anything that he wants for you, you are willing to embrace. I also realize that there's other individuals here whose heart aren't quite that hard. They're not, heart, they're not pursuing the things of God like you are. But let me say this, please understand that God's desire for each and every one of us hasn't changed no matter how you feel. He wants us to be a people who are called by his name, who know not only the God who created things, but have a personal relationship with him. And prayer is such a part of their lives that they don't forsake it even when Pastor Mike changes the time. Even when it doesn't fit into their schedule. Even when something else is going on and the world is saying you should be doing this and we choose to do this. It doesn't matter. What matters is how you choose to respond with this avenue of connection. Because as much as prayer is a platform for the hypocrite, as much as prayer is a platform for pride and for a public proclamation of self, it can also be a huge point of contact. Prayer can become the platform that lifts you up to a point. Jesus said, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. The same platform of prayer that can bring pride and arrogance and self-centeredness and attention to us can also be the same platform that takes us up to the throne of grace and where we find our needs being supplied by the only one who loves us more than ourselves. Amen? We have got to realize as Jesus was talking here, he said, listen, prayer is a platform. Don't use it like the hypocrites use it. They do it publicly to get people to look at them. Now, before we get into this whole thing about, well, should I pray publicly or privately? You need to realize that Jesus said, this is your avenue to bring God glory. And if you really want to do what Jesus did, realize Jesus prayed out loud as well as prayed privately. The point here is not public prayer versus private prayer. It's the motive of the heart. It's the point of contact that you're trying to make. The Satanist prays to Satan to try to get in contact with something. The Christian prays to try to get in contact with something. And the same platform can be used for pride or it can be used for humility. Jesus goes on in verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room. When you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I would challenge you to build a prayer closet that is in your house. Do it. Find a room. It doesn't have to be a closet. The problem with some of our closets is they're so full of stuff, we dare not open the door. And even though that's true in the physical, what about our emotional closets? What about closing the door in on our emotions? I know, and I've been there too. You go to prayer, and it seems like that's the time you remember everything you didn't get done. What's that mean? That means your mind is so cluttered with so much stuff, you can't shut the door. The truth is we need to clean out the closet, not just get out of the closet. We need to clean the closet to get in the closet so we can be in that quiet place with the Lord. Verse 
7. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you need of before you ask Him. The prayers that miss. I mentioned that earlier. What happens to unanswered prayers? There's a great book written several years ago said the fire of unanswered prayers. And I believe when God says, wait a while, it's hard. Some of you have prayed prayers and you've been praying for a long time. And you're wondering, why hasn't God answered that prayer? The fire of unanswered prayers challenges your ability to believe God and trust God more than you trust yourself. The unanswered prayers that that go up into heaven are not ignored, but they are put in a time and a place. One person said it this way, God never, God doesn't not, God does not not answer a prayer. Do you get that? (laughs) He typically says no, which sometimes we just keep knocking, right? Or he'll say yes, which we love those. I tell you, when, when God answers a prayer, there is a point of entrance in our faith that opens up, right? When all of a sudden God answers our prayers, like, yes! We get excited, we get encouraged. Energy swells into our faith. Our faith becomes greater and we begin to say, God, if you can answer this prayer, then let's pray for more. That's the power of an answered prayer. A prayer that misses ends up finding us discouraged, right? Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? The prayer that God says, no, and we didn't get our way, we get discouraged. But let me, let me share something with you. Do you realize that no is an answered prayer? When God says no, he answered your prayer? Years ago, there was a country song written, thank God for unanswered prayers. How long did it take you? to thank God for a prayer that didn't get answered? Or how long did it take you to be able to look back and say, you know what, God, thank you that you didn't answer that prayer or that you answered it by a no instead of giving me what I thought I needed. But when God says, wait, that is a tough one. Why? Because we're so tempted to be like that girl on on, uh, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. And I forget her name. Thank you. All of y'all know it. Some of you know it. I want it now, Daddy. Now. When prayers are told to wait, when the answers to our prayers are no, we find ourselves discouraged, disappointed, delusioned. I know people who have basically given up on God because they didn't get their way. There are people out here who have resisted and and now today refuse to embrace anything good from God because of one prayer that didn't go their way. Delusion leads to depression. Depression often finds ourselves dealing and dabbling with death. Why didn't God answer my prayer? Does he hate me? You see, prayer and unanswered prayers can easily become a platform for self-centeredness. There's a whole lot more on this prayer thing, but let me stick with what Jesus said. When he said, don't use vain repetitions, in other words, it's not in how much you pray. It's how honest you pray. People have been raised to say certain things in prayer and we, we saw it displayed here in kind of a funny way of using the old Shakespearean English. And there's some people that get really wrapped up in that. Some people get wrapped up in, in, in sticking to a King James Version. I'm going to tell you this and I mean this seriously. It is not as important the word you use as the heart you use. Because the truth is God knows the heart. And get over the idea that you're going to pray and not ask for anything. Embrace the idea that prayer becomes that avenue where with thanksgiving, I can find relief, I can find answers, and I can find the source to everything I need. Realize that prayer is one thing that God has given us so that we can embrace the opportunities to make our requests known. 
The idea of a certain prayer or this kind of prayer or this position or, or this place and this kind of thing. Well, if this happened, I can pray. If this isn't happening, I can't pray. All these things contrary and they fight against. And you know who wins when we stop praying? The devil. You know who wins when we start letting little things get in our way of our relationship with Jesus Christ? Ourself. And as I've said so many times, this, this first fruits, humbly readjust your life so that you can be more like Jesus. And when it comes to prayer, consider seriously the things that are causing you to go in a direction that is contrary to what Jesus said to do. Don't use prayer as a platform for pride. Use it as a platform to get in connection with Jesus Christ. And find the source of hope. Find the source of peace. A point of contact where you can discover the purpose of God for your situation, for your life, for your day, for your week, for your month, for your children, for your boss, and even for your enemies. Jesus goes on to lay down a pattern and I, I like this verse because you need, you need to grasp this verse, which we find in uh, verse 8. He says, Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, verse 9 says. In other words, it did not say repeat these words. It says, in this manner. What is the manner? What are the principles in each of these phrases that Jesus teaches? I want to challenge you. That what Jesus teaches his disciples to pray is a statement that every statement challenges our dependence on ourself. Let me show you to it this way. The first part of this prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is a statement of extreme respect. The idea of being hallowed means you don't secularize the name of Jesus. And the person who is out here using the name of the Lord in vain and then goes to prayer needs to realize that what they are doing is something that God never created them to do. James says, can blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth? Can sweet water and bitter water come out of the same? Well, no. And so what happens when you go to prayer after a week of swearing and after a week of using the name of the Lord in vain and then you go to prayer and act like you can all of a sudden become so self-righteously holy and declare our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He says, you don't care a thing about my name. You don't want my name to be hallowed in your life. You don't want my name to be hallowed in your wife. You don't want my name to be hallowed on a train. You don't want my name to be hallowed. Dr. Seuss, huh? But it's the truth. This statement of the manner in which we are to pray lets us know that prayer is a place of extreme respect. This idea that I can walk around and somehow modify the name of the Lord just so I fit in. Listen, God is not the big guy upstairs. He's the only guy upstairs. And he's got a name. If you don't know it, he'll probably overlook your slang. But if you know the name and you've been saved by the name, and you reverence the name, then use it hallowedly. Use it in a holy, respectful, reverent way. Not because you're scared of God, but because you are aware of His awesome power and His awesome presence and His awesome love. And when you go before Him, you are going before Him to reverence His power and name. And that is not built out of a fear that keeps you away from. It is a built out of a love that desires to be ever so much closer. The manner in which he said to pray challenges our self-exaltation. I understand the challenge of being trying to bridge the gap between different, different types of people or different types of, uh, of situations. 
But the person who has gone into a situation where they didn't know God and said, yeah, you can just call him the big guy, has done God and in service and has done the sinner and an unjust in service as well. Disservice, rather. That is not a name to be messed with. And let me just say one more thing as your pastor. Those of you who've gotten into a habit of using slangs that are cover-ups for the precious, powerful, everlasting name of Jesus, repent. Clean out your mouth. Clean out your mind. Change the way you approach him. Jesus says when you pray, pray in a way that allows self to be demoted, self to be laid on the altar, and the precious, powerful name of Jesus to be exalted in your life. When Paul said, make your life a living sacrifice, that's exactly what he meant. Lay yourself down at the expense of raising his name high. In that manner, you approach God. Yo, Big Daddy, what's up? Something just doesn't ring through with that, does it? It doesn't match up with what Jesus said. And we're not here to condemn anybody. But I'm telling you, for you and your household, and for us and our household here, we need to embrace this manner in which Jesus said, come to the house of the Lord. Come to your time of prayer. Come to those places of prayer with this attitude that I will not exalt myself, but I will hallow his name. The next part, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, is a request, a plea, a prayer for identity. God, I want your will to be noticeable in my life. I want your plan to be noticeable in my life. Therefore, I want to be identified with the things in heaven, not with the things on earth. I want my identity, who I am in this world, to be connected undeniably with the, with the divine, not the secular, not the sinful. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. The acknowledging of our position established in that first phrase then becomes a submission to his will in the next phrase. It keeps us humble when we realize, I don't know it all. It keeps us humble when we realize God has a plan and let his will be done, not mine. And that challenges our self-importance. How important is your schedule compared to God's schedule? How important is your time compared to your time with God? One person said this, show me your schedule and show me your wallet and I'll show you who your God is. Show me where you give your time, show me where you give your treasure and that's who your God is. The challenge for us is to keep those things in place, isn't it? Why? Because God wants us to have a powerful prayer life. He wants us to be those who go from glory to glory, from greater to greater, growing in our faith, excited about what God has done. Matter of fact, my daughter and I were watching something just recently, and, and Ray Vanderlaan made this comment, our children don't know how to celebrate the good things of God because they don't see parents celebrating. Oh, we can do the sprinkler when our team scores a touchdown. We can do the dances. We can do all of these things when other things happen. We get a pay raise. Somebody did what was right. But what about what God, when do your children, I'm telling you parents, when do your children, when's the last time your children saw you so excited about what God had done in your life that they look back and went, whoa. And if it's been a while, I want to ask yourself, is God's will happening in your life? Because God's will is that we celebrate and enjoy his presence in our lives. God's ways are far above our ways. We are the clay, he's the potter, and we've got to realize that as I put my importance down and I lift him up, he will lift me up. Amen? Help me out here. Is anybody here understand what I'm talking about when I say that if you will put God first, he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory? You've got to realize I am not just up here trying to get you to do something that Pastor Mike wants you. I am telling you, God will supply your needs if you walk in the manner that Jesus tells us to. 
The next thing Jesus says is, give us this day our daily bread. This keeps us trusting in God rather than trusting in ourselves. It challenges self-sufficiency. And there are so many of us who are wrestling with this. I don't want to depend on anybody. I'm a self-made man. I can do this all by myself. And you know what? We find ourselves constantly having to come back to these places where, you know what? You do need somebody else. The fact that you made a doctor's appointment for this next week or this next month simply says you can't fix yourself. The fact that you humbled yourself and went before an employer and said, I want this job, simply states you can't make your own money. The fact that the drug lord out here has to go find uh, somebody to go take their drugs, has to find somebody to supply, we're not independent of each other. And as much as you may be frustrated by other people in your life, the truth is we need each other. And so giving me this day my daily bread is that cry that says, God, I'm trusting you more than I trust myself, even for the basic needs in my life. I am being challenged with this this realm of self-sufficiency. And as a result, I am going to trust you even for the simple things in my life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Who's feeding your spiritual tank? Jesus said, I am the living water. Who's quenching the thirst of your soul? This prayer, this manner of constant dependence on God is huge. In the next place, a passage of scripture that we are very familiar with, forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is a plea for accountability. Some people can't pray this prayer. Some people pray it and don't even know what they're praying. Because what this prayer is saying is, God, I want you to forgive me just like I forgive other people. You know what that means? If you don't forgive him, he doesn't forgive you. Matter of fact, you want a verse for the unpardonable sin? There's one. The sin he won't forgive is the one you won't forgive others for. That's hard. That's a challenge. You want to be average and walk around, spend your life with revenge, bitterness, guilt, hatred, regret, resentment? Or do you want to be free from that? God will let you, listen to me, God will let you experience his saving grace and then let you walk around with an offense the rest of your life. It's not his will. It's not his plan. He doesn't want it that way. But if you won't forgive, God won't forgive. That point is so important. He repeats it at the very end of this this, this section on prayer. We'll get to that in a little bit. This concept of accountability keeps us from self-righteousness. It keeps us honest with God. You pray that part of that prayer and you really take the time to listen. God will tell you who you need to deal with. God will tell you what you need to deal with. Why? Because he wants to forgive you more than you want to forgive the other person. And sometimes the hardest person to forgive is ourselves. So let me ask you, can you, can you, according to this verse, truly experience the forgiveness of God if the person that you won't forgive is the person you see in the mirror? Verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Imagine living your life with blindfolds on. The truth is, that's exactly how we find ourselves oftentimes. The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded people's eyes. And folks, listen, there's a lot of things I'm blind to. I shared it last year over and over and over. I have blind spots in my life. Not just in my mirrors, but in my life. I need to cry out for protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I want to keep depending on God even when I think I've got it all together. That's why I pray. Lead me not into temptation. I need to trust God even when I feel confident in myself. And therefore, I challenge self-reliance by saying, God, I want you to lead me, not me. I want to follow, 
You lead. I'll follow. And when you lead me, Lord, don't lead me into temptation. Because I don't want to be there. I want to be close to the master. I want to be under the shadow of his wing. I want to be right where he wants me to be. The last statement, a statement of perspective, is where Jesus says, thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever. Amen. This particular part of the prayer keeps us with a good biblical world view. When your world view has little room for God and a lot of room for other things, you are out of balance. Repent. This keep God in, in ownership and it challenges our concept of self-government. I'm convinced that there's some people who have experienced God's grace, God's mercy, God's miracles. And yet if God were to tell, tell them to do something that they didn't want to do, they wouldn't do it. Why? Because God's kind of like a credit card to them. They only use it when they're in trouble. Other people, he's only there if he says what they like. And we got to wrestle with that, don't we? Because the truth is, if I am in control of my life, he's not. And if I am defending myself, he's not. And if I am self-sufficient, I'm not trusting him. If I am self-reliant, I'm not trusting him. If I am constantly walking on his grace, trampling his name throughout the week in my actions and in my words, I am not hallowing his name in my life. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus ends this section on prayer with a very clear reinforcement of what we find in verse 12. He says this, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I am convinced that one of the things that makes us more anxious about tomorrow is relationships. Your relationship with your teacher can make you anxious on a Sunday when there's no school. Your relationship with your children, with your spouse, with your neighbors. And what Jesus is saying in these verses is God cares about everything. And what he chooses to underscore at the very end is you better get your relationships right. You better get your relationships right. Because if your relationship with other people that Jesus died for is not where it's supposed to be, your relationship with God is not where it's supposed to be. And you can't serve two masters. You will either do it your way or you will do it God's way. And I'm convinced that for years, most of us have, have found ourselves battling between these two things. We know we know there's a way that seems right to us and yet we know there's a better way. And the challenge is to find that better way and to make it happen in our lives. You've got a choice. I've got a choice. What are you going to do with your tomorrow? And for some of you, that's, that's too far off. There's no guarantee tomorrow will come for you. Another mall shooting I found out. I haven't heard all the details. I haven't read it. But was there casualties? Anybody know? Two casualties. And I wonder if those two people thought they had a tomorrow. I wonder if those two people were going to do some things tomorrow that they just didn't have time for today. I wonder if those people had plans, dreams, hopes, I'm not trying to scare you. I don't want to scare you. But I want to challenge you. Be anxious for nothing. One version says, don't worry about anything. But pray about everything. Why? Because that's where we find relief. That's where we remember what good things he has done. 
And that's where we can make our requests known and find God's grace anew and fresh.